Serving the business community. True change is going to require a whole systems approach. So the more representatives we have to give voices to the different parts of the system, the better. The purpose of this session is to learn from the point of view of what they are representing, as well as ways that we, as climate reality leaders, can help ensure that each voice is represented in our efforts to assist businesses in acknowledging the different parts for considerations in their planning and execution. So let me introduce our wonderful speakers for this session on serving the business community. Magdara Doyle. Magdara is a representative of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, the largest civil society organization on the island of Ireland, representing and campaigning on behalf of some 800,000 working people speaking as the voice of the employee. Fern Wixon. Fern is a professor at UOT, the Arctic University of Norway. Her work focuses on interactions between science, ethics, and politics in environmental conservation and management, speaking as the voice of nature. Caitlin Southwick. Caitlin is the founder and executive director of Key Culture and Sustainability in Conservation. She holds a professional doctorate in conservation and re uh, restoration of cultural heritage from University of Amsterdam, speaking as the voice of culture and creativity. A very warm welcome to you all. I have a couple of questions for all of you that I would uh, like to hear from um, every speaker. So my first question is, could you please share with us some important aspects about climate action in business from the point of view uh, which you are representing? Okay, um, maybe if I just said a few words about the uh, some background about the, the context and the situation here in Ireland it might give some some insights into into what's happening. Um, just to say that the, the the situation in Ireland, I mean, we've not been immune like any other country to the just transition part to the transition process, um, and on paper we're doing extremely well. Uh, as, a, as a country, we've introduced a new climate law, a new climate action plan. We've now legally binding targets to reach 51% reduction uh, by 2030 in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, net zero no later than 2050. We're in the process of agreeing a new series of carbon budgets. Um, our governments have over the years been very vocal and supportive of the concept and idea of just transition. They enthusiastically backed the 2015 Paris Agreement, which as we know was the first global accord to put just transition right at the centre, very explicitly. Um, they supported the Silesia Declaration, they put their name to a very progressive just transition pledge that came out of COP26. So on paper, um, and this is a crucial learning, on paper, uh, it's all been very positive in Ireland. <laughs> Unfortunately, the actual reality on the ground has been extremely different. Um, and I think there's a very important, very important learnings to be had from this. Um, we have absolutely nothing approaching a just transition framework or structure put in place in this country at the moment. Um, so while we don't have traditional carbon industries such as oil or, or, or coal mining, uh, we do have a very important peat harvesting sector. And that's where the transition hit first. Um, and peat has been used here domestically as a fuel and also an electricity generation for many, 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 many years. Um, so it's in this region and it's based in one particular part of the country. So it's this, this is where the transition hit first um, about two to three years ago. Um, and it's the experience has been quite poor. The peat harvesting that had existed for generations was brought to a very sudden and very abrupt halt. Um, and about a thousand people very quickly lost their jobs in a region that didn't have many employment opportunities. Um, and the sad irony is that the, the workforce themselves had already agreed and negotiated a managed wind down of their industry over 10 years or so. So they saw a change was coming and they embraced it and they supported it. Um, but difficulties emerged and unfortunately, uh, government and the company walked away and left them hanging. 
um, and there were no support systems put in place, no structures to help the workers and communities uh, transition from one employment to another, no proactive engagement in advance. And even now, two to three years down the line, we've seen no real signal uh, job creating mechanism or, or job creating uh, initiative to replace the jobs that have been lost in those communities. So the communities have been net losers in this. Um, and why is this important? Well, this was the first place that transition arrived in Ireland. So it was the litmus test for the transition in this country. And so workers across all sectors of the economy watched what was happening. And they saw what was happening and they got inc incredibly discouraged. Um, and the result now is that we have a, strong, a very severe and growing erosion of trust, not in just transition, but in the transition process overall. Uh, and in the promises that it originally held out. So the loss of confidence, a loss of trust, um, where once there was enthusiasm uh, and openness to change. Um, you know, we asked people to sacrifice their jobs for the life, for the benefit of future generations, and then we left them hanging. Um, and the, the problem there, as I say, is if, if it, unless that is, is changed very dramatically, uh, and unless we see a very dramatic shift in policy, what will happen in Ireland, and this I suspect may happen in other countries as well, is that the transition process itself will become synonymous with job losses, with lower living standards, and with poorer communities. And no individual in their right mind will voluntarily opt for that. They will, they will hold on to what they have. And if that happens, distrust will harden into opposition, politically, nationally, um, at all levels. I just, just, just finish on this point. Uh, um, I just saw a very interesting survey recently from the Trade Union Congress in the UK, which are our sister group in the UK, Sister Trade Union Federation. And they showed about 86% of the workers they have surveyed just in the last month or so really, really strongly supported climate action. And we have the same experience here. But those positive figures plummeted when uh, they were asked, do they have confidence in how government was approaching the, 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 the transition process? And secondly, um, it plummeted right down to about 10% of uh, workers who were actually consulted by their employers on how climate change could be managed. So you can see that how that enthusiasm can very, very quickly erode and very quickly be lost. So that, in a word or in, an, in, in a nutshell, explains why trade unions are so, so, uh, I suppose, I think the, the right word, we're, we're so insistent on the necessity for a just transition. Uh, it is the only realistic means to actually deliver this uh, transition in a sustainable and fair manner. Absolutely, without leaving no one behind, which is a crucial issue and definitely needs to be addressed. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Fran, could you also share with us uh, your point of view on this? Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be with you. I, I am representing nature today. I've been asked to come from the point of view of nature. So I'm going to take that quite seriously. Um, and from the point of view of nature, I would say we have we have three key things to say and recognize and communicate. And the first of these is everything is connected. This isn't a battle between people and nature or people in the environment. We are one blue planet floating in the vast expanses of space. We are all interconnected. There is no competition. We are in this together. We are one. Um, there is no us and them. There is only us in the blue planet of nature. And in that same sense of everything being connected, there's no uh, climate crisis separate from a biodiversity crisis, from a pollution crisis, from uh, an understanding of ourselves crisis, from a justice crisis, from an equity crisis. All of these are interlinked and they're all needing to be addressed and solved in integrative manners because we're all one in this little blue bubble floating in the vast expanses of space. There is also a sense that I want to say that nature, um, that me, I am nature today, that we, that I am the source of all. I'm the source and sink of everything. Any business uh, that you are thinking you're engaging with, that we are conducting together. 
anything that is made and produced and consumed comes can be traced back to to nature can be traced back to source and anything that comes out of business can be uh, traced back to source it leads back to source everything is interconnected in the blue bubble uh, floating in the vast expanses of space. I also want to say there are no straight lines is my second le lesson as representing the point of view of nature. There's no straight lines. There's only circles. There's no linearity. There's no um, a way. There is only round and round and round. And when we think about businesses and what we're doing in businesses, we have to think in circles and we have to increasingly expand our notion of we're not in production systems that work in linear ways, whatever we produce has to come back and go back. And if it's not coming back in a nourishing way, um, then it's coming back in a polluting way. And it's not polluting something out there. It's polluting us that live in common in this little blue bubble floating in the vast expanses of space. And thirdly, I want to say that do no harm is no longer sufficient. We have to do good we have to actively um, restore, we have to regenerate, we have to compensate for damage already done. So the idea that I start my business now and look forward and try and do no harm, is not enough. Um, we have to regenerate, restore and compensate for the damage we've already done. And I have plenty more to say, but I don't want to hold the mic too long. And I want to leave the floor open for others. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Fran. Beautifully said. Uh, I always use this in my talks um, and on my show. It is uh, all about understanding that interconnectedness and that the environment is in us and not outside of us. So thank you so much for beautifully explaining that. Um, Caitlin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I just would like to echo what you said about, you know, Fern's painting of the of this picture of interconnectivity and how important that is. And I'm here today representing culture. And culture is such a huge part of this interconnectivity and actually often quite overlooked. Um, both from the role it plays in terms of contributions to uh, climate crisis, but also in terms of it, the opportunities. And for a long time, the cultural sector was seen to, you know, not really play a huge part of uh, in the climate conversation. And a large reason for that was because, as Fern said, it was not really doing any harm. It was too small of a piece of the pie, or it was something that you know was doing good in other aspects, so it was okay. There was a, sort of this ends justify the means mentality, and. Thank goodness that's changed in the last five years or so, where um, culture as a sector has really realized that it's no longer okay to justify um, production of art or um, or conservation of heritage in a way that is damaging to our planet. And we now have this, um, it's, and I have to say that I come from a sector that um, I'm very lucky because it's low hanging fruit. People in the cultural sector are very excited about engaging. They want to be more sustainable, but the biggest barrier is finances. And this goes back to the interconnectivity of sustainability. You know, it's not just the environmental aspect, but the financial aspect, the social aspect. And I think that's incredibly prevalent when we are talking about the cultural sector. And um, it's not just about transitioning to a greener, more environmentally friendly practice, but it's really about the communication and the opportunity we have to connect with our audiences and to connect with our communities and to become leaders for the transition to a sustainable future and to show what that is and also to demonstrate why it's important. Because culture has a way of connecting with people that Many other sectors um, lack in terms of that that empathetic and really deep personal understanding that can be created through a cultural experience. So culture, for me, you know, has to be at the center of this. I mean, I, but along with everyone else, as we're as we're discussing today, this is something that we cannot do alone, and we have to be working together towards. And um, so that's why I'm I'm just very excited to be here talking about um, how we, as the cultural sector, would like to help uh, work with us. 
Thank you, Caitlin. And absolutely, I couldn't agree more um, in uh, when it comes to sustainable development and sustainability, which is my uh, field of expertise. Uh, we always uh, talk about culture and the local knowledge that has been uh, overlooked for, for centuries. And uh, it is definitely one of the key points to tackling the climate crisis and I really hope that with the growing awareness we can definitely make sure that this is highlighted because it is absolutely crucial if we are to succeed and uh, win this battle. Uh, so I'm moving on to my next question for all of you. As climate reality leaders and other stakeholders, what can we do to ensure that every voice is represented in our efforts to assist businesses? So, Magdara, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, and if I could just go back to back to one thing the previous speaker said, I absolutely agree. It's about communication. That's absolutely essential. But I think you also have to bear in mind that certainly in the sector I work in, uh, in across a whole range of, uh, of industries, people get this, they grasp it, they understand it, they know it, they know it because they're on the front line of this. They can see their sectors and their industry changing, you know, on a daily basis almost at this stage, if you go into some, uh, some parts of the economy. So they get it and they understand it. What they're looking for is direction and that coherent framework that allows them to shift from one to the other. They're happy to do it. They want to do it and they're enthusiastic to, but it's that direction and that framework that's absent at the moment. Um, and that, I suppose, is the, is the crucial lesson. That sense of engagement, that sense of, be of belonging, that sense of ownership um, that you would get with a just transition framework. I mean, if you understand a just transition as being simply, uh, you as you close down one older model of an older economy, the carbon-based economy, and you shift to the newer, greener economy, so to speak, um, what the Just Transition does, it provides a bridge from one to the other. It assists and supports the workers and the communities to, you know, to move from one to the other uh, as seamlessly as possible. Um, and within that, and in doing that, you, you require consultation, you require engagement, you require social dialogue, you require people giving people a sense that they are shaping their own future and have a role to play in shaping their own future. And this is not change that is being done to them, but they are helping to shape and change themselves. This is change that is happening and that they're part of, not that's being done to them. And I think one of the big problems we have, certainly in the European Union, um, is that there is a, a residual legacy of what happened after the financial crash in, tw in 2008 on and onwards. And what happened in the aftermath, aftermath, there was a, a certain policy response in which change was done to communities and done to people in a very negative way. And there is that residual legacy there that is, you know, um, worse. Well, we see the outbreak, we see the effects of that, you know, almost every day. It played a significant role in Brexit. Um, but so, you know, to go back to that sense of engagement, of a coherent framework, of a direction, of a consultation, and of bringing people with you and not punishing them because they have no other option. So, you know, we would have a particular view, say, around the carbon tax. That's important. But if you're taxing someone who has no other option but to use a particular form of transport to get to work and there's no option available in their area, that's unfair. That's penalizing people. So you, you know, and that makes the transition a negative thing rather than a positive thing. So there has to be that sense of a framework of a coherent vision and of a shared vision. I'll leave Thank it you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Fan, uh, could we please have your take on the second question? Sure. When I have my hat on as representing the point of view of nature, one thing that is very clear and very obvious is that the strength in diversity, that nature is flourishing when it's diverse. And so when we're talking about bringing multiple voices on board, I think we have to also think of diverse uh, futures. It's not about the sustainable shift. It's not about the green economy. And it's not even about the direction or the coherent 
single shared direction. It's opening up for plurality also in where we're going and how we're doing it and how we're going. Yes, bring multiple voices on board, but if we try and squeeze that into one shared vision, one shared direction, um, we're going to stumble. We need to extend our embrace of diversity, not just to having the multiple voices coming in, but the multiple directions and the multiple pathways we have to sustainability. It also allows us um, so much more hope and freedom that there's not one right answer here. So the tax is a perfect example. One tax having all these unjust implications. Okay, we need diverse applications of this idea, or maybe that idea doesn't work in this place or that place. We need to open up for multiple diverse pathways pathways uh, and that's a way to allow all the voices to be heard too when we're not forcing them into a singular consensus on a singular way forward. I think that's really crucial and from the point of view of nature all voices being heard is really challenging because consultation with nature is is requiring creativity and more cultural based approaches to engage multi-species actors, to think about the agency of uh, river systems or of mountains, or to how do we have the voices of metals enter into our um, conversations? How do we have the voices of, of a damselfly come into our conversations? We need unique approaches and that requires sort of creativity and, and thinking broadly about what consultation means and what it means to allow multiple voices to come in when we extend beyond the human voices and to be, of course, embracing all the human voices is challenging enough. Um, but if we embrace the, um, the creative potential that can be unlocked when we think about how to bring in the multiple voices of nature and nature's agency, I think we can start to see some really interesting ways to engage with businesses when we ask them to think about what different uh, organisms and entities of nature would look like in a consultative process and what they might say and, and how they might communicate their perspectives. Thank you, Fern. And uh, Kate Slink, could we please also have your take on the second question? Well, Fern just said it. I'm teasing. <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't agree more with both speakers. I think that um, this this process has to be inclusive, but it's not just about inclusion, it's about belonging. and. Um, there's an amazing professor at UC Berkeley, Dr. Powell, who talks about the difference between inclusivity and belonging. And he always, he says, um, it's like having a party. And if you're throwing a party and you don't invite someone to your party, that's exclusion. And if you are throwing a party and you invite somebody, that's inclusion. But it's come to my party. It's at my house. I'm, you know, making the rules. You can come, but this is my rules, my house. And then there's belonging, which is, oh, I'm having a party. Would you like to come? What do you think the theme should be? Getting involved in that co-creation and that that process of having that sense of ownership. And that's just, you know, obviously a very uh, banal example, but it's the same thing here. You know, it's about making people feel that they're part of this change, um, giving people the agency to be a part of the discussion. But as Fern said, not just people. It's about extending our minds and it's about looking at how nature's involved with this and stopping, stop separating ourselves from nature. As, as Fern mentioned at the beginning, it's not humans versus nature. This is how can we have a symbiotic relationship that's mutually beneficial. And I think that, um, you know, this is why I'm so passionate about culture being leaders in this is because indeed, this is going to take some creativity. Mm -hmm. This is going to take some outside of the box thinking. This is going to take new approaches. And the cultural professionals have this training. We have this inherent, um, unique skill set that takes this creativity not only in terms of communication, but in terms of problem solving. Um, I'm, I'm actually an art conservator by training. I was a, a practicing stone conservator for eight years. And, you know, the skill sets that we have about looking at value systems versus, you know, historical aspects, material aspects, artistic aspects, and uh, scientific aspects, materialism, and all of these different things that um, are really different than a lot of businesses gives skill sets that 
can have problem solving in a unique way. And I think that one thing that's really interesting we're talking about business today is that a lot of times when people look at the cultural sector, they don't think about business. But at the end of the day, it is a business. And one of the big problems, as I mentioned already, is the financial restraint and the financial unsustainability of the sector, which inhibits it from getting involved. And you know, we were talking a little bit early about the opportunities and, and having people be able to be engaged, but it's also about having, you know, not just having people be part of the transition, but also having people be part of a just transition, as we mentioned, and, and just also means security. And, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get people, as, as we already said, on board when it feels like it's not a choice, but also when it feels, um, like it's not uh, possible from a financial perspective, and so I think that it's 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 an interesting combination there. But I, yeah, I from from the with the cultural hat on, I think that this is this is exactly how culture can contribute: is being a part of the facilitators of these conversations, being um, putting our creative juices into thinking about how we can connect people with nature, how we can bring nature into the conversations, and uh, the educational aspects and programming that that culture has uh, in order to connect with people and connect people with each other. Absolutely, Caitlin. Um, I do agree. I think we are so very much involved in this uh, so-called Western knowledge that we have forgotten. And what we really need here is to embrace all knowledges, which culture is a part of that, the local knowledges. And the moment I think we start uh, thinking about uh, all of us as a whole and as subjects and not looking at other beings as objects. I think that's when we can actually uh, move forward and um, have that um, inclusive thinking that we are all talking about here. Uh, we do have a few questions uh, for you from our audience as well. Um, so if I may, the first question, uh, as leaders in the sector, how do you generate the enthusiasm of the individual when there is no urgency in the everyday actions of governments? Um, it's difficult. <laughs> I mean, if when people are looking to governments to give a lead and give an example and to set the pace, uh, as we traditionally do, um, it's difficult when that fails even to match their expectations or when when it impacts them negatively because i mean most of what you know certainly when we started discussing the or having that national conversation around transition in this country we framed it very much in terms of a, a very positive experience with many many opportunities to actually create probably a fairer more equal society um a more sustainable society um, and, oh, you know, the, the, the reality, as I said, for, for, for too many people at this stage has actually been negative. So there's nothing worse, history will tell you, nothing worse than dashing expectations. Um, it's actually quite a, you know, that leaves a, a long, long lasting effect. Um, so how you keep that enthusiasm, um, I think you have to just keep pressing for that overall coherent, cohesive framework. And I do agree, there is not one size fits all. There cannot be one size fits all. But when you create a framework, it has to be adaptable to the local conditions in every country, in every society, in every sector. And it has to take all of those diverses, divergences and differences uh, into account. But you have to give people a sense. So for, for example, I go back to the, um, one of the most if there is one positive upside that came out of the pandemic as, as we slowly emerge from it some at a, a, a different place from others but as we slowly emerge it's that societies will can and do uh, get behind uh, a, a, that kind of sense of shared vision or shared challenge if they're given a clear sense of what it is and a clear sense of what the path out of it is and what lies ahead and what lies in you know what the benefits are People will and societies do by and large unite when that sense of a shared vision is there. I mean, already though, I mean, the, the pandemic, you know, may just, may be a, or we may just be emerging, but it seems to me we've already lost that crucial learning and we certainly haven't applied it to the transition. And there is no sense of that bigger picture. 
uh, of, of, of being communicated or being delivered or no sense of that, that, that better direction. It's, it's just not there. So without that, it's very difficult to keep that enthusiasm. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question. Speaking about culture, how can we make the transition smooth for scenarios without blaming them for the crisis? How can we bring them on board? Um, that's a good question. I think, you know, I, I always tell people that there's no real point in blaming. Um, it's not going to get us anywhere. I think that, you know, we, we know where the problems are, but shaming, blaming, um, is, is not productive. And I think, especially from the cultural sector, there's no real point in singling out a particular class or a particular age group or a particular, um, sector and just, you know, saying, let's all make them the scapegoat, um, that's not going to help anybody. <laughs> we can say, we can say, you know, this is, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say that it's seniors faults. It's, they didn't know any better. You know, we didn't understand the implications of things. There are so many different reasons that that's not a productive conversation. And I, I think that just, um, looking, looking at the solutions rather than the, the, you know, folk dwelling on the causes is going to be really helpful. I think what we were talking about earlier about this bigger picture idea um, is really important in terms of let's figure out how we can paint what that future looks like. And let's get seniors involved with that. Um, the, invite them in for co-creation, invite them in. Let's, let's have this belonging where, you know, people who maybe have contributed to the problem can now be part of the solution. And I think that that's, once again, what culture's power is, is that this is not a situation where culture has this role to say, okay, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. I mean, that's not sustainable from any stretch of the imagination, environmentally or socially. And I think that um, it's about it's about figuring out what that vision is for the future and how every everyone can feel a part of that. And that's that's co-creation. And I think that that's um, actually something that makes it a little bit difficult right now is that a lot of people lack that vision of what does the future look like and what does a sustainable future look like. And um, if we can get, you know, the I think the creative sector is going to be a huge part of that about, you know, opening up our minds and looking at what potential futures could look like in a sustainable way where it's not just what we're doing now, business as usual, but less bad. Um, you know, but it was actually something that's truly regenerative, truly sustainable, truly climate central. So um, I, I think that it, when it comes to blaming, you know, I think that it's it's not about. Um, I, I, I think that you you can't have that as part of the conversation for solutions. It's just not productive. Thank you, Caitlin. I believe there is one more question. Um, yes, transformation will affect all of us, but there are communities that are more exposed where transition must start. How do you see the need for increasing solidarity towards those groups? Do you want me to, or sure? Look. Look, in, 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 the, the one good thing about climate change um, is that we know we, we can predict a lot of what is going to happen. We can, for example, look four or five, ten years down the line and know where jobs are going to be lost, where jobs are going to be changed, where uh, industries are going to change, where some are going to die out, new ones are going to be born and so on. And, you know, you go back over the course of history for, from the Industrial Re Revolution on, that has been a continual cycle of change. Industries have died, new ones have been born and so on. But we can look now with a fair degree of, of, of kind of accuracy over the next five years and see what communities are most vulnerable and are particularly on the front line. And it's, it's you know, it, it's not rocket science. You simply get into the community or get into the sector and get to those who are most exposed and most vulnerable and proactively engage with them and bring them in and say, okay, we see this coming down the line. So if you have an enterprise that, you know, you know in 12 to 18 months 
is going to be extremely vulnerable to transition and, and, and is threatened possibly with closure. You get in there now and you start working with the people in there, the, 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 the workers and the management, you start working with them and saying, OK, what do we need to put in place? What measures do we need to identify to offset the worst of this change in terms of job loss or economic uh, economic loss? And what measures can we put in place to take advantage of the opportunities that will be arising? Because opportunities are also part of the process. So it's early and active engagement, um, you know, rather than arriving after the fact with a wonderful plan it's too late now thank you um and yes the last question uh, how to raise awareness about the interconnectedness between nature and us what are the ways to encourage people to understanding that very important concept I think you can do it in, in so many ways. It can start with your next breath. You breathe in, where is that coming from? You need it to stay alive. And it is with every single breath that you are interconnected, that you are interconnected to all of the green forms of life that are creating the oxygen that you breathe in. With that next breath, take it now. That is an acknowledgement of your connection. And as you exhale, you're returning. It's your gift in return. And you don't stop at the connection of the green life that has offered you the oxygen that you need to survive. Trace the lines back. What is that green life? Let's take a tree as an example, although I never want to neglect our friends, the algae. Um, that that tree requires all kinds of soil microorganisms to survive. And if you trace the lines back, you just see a vast web of how everyone is dependent on everyone else. And it can start with that breath and you're breathing multiple times um, every single minute. But it's the food you eat. It's all the things you take into your body. But you can even question um, the the shape of your body, the shape of who you are, you know, this idea that you're actually made up of more bacterial cells than you are human cells. What does that mean in reality? What is the implication of that? So having this kind of deep questioning about who you are and where are the borders of yourself? And anytime you try to draw borders around yourself and call it a human, um, you will hit problems and you will hit challenges because of the, the deeply entwined nature of your interconnections. So I think that sort of reflecting on that, reflecting on everything you take in, oxygen, food, et cetera, and where it comes from and how it's delivered to you, water, not less, um, all the things around you, the clothes, try and draw the lines back. Where did this come from? This was a plant at some point. The computer in front of me, all of the pieces, the energy and the lines and the cables that connect us. If I trace those back, I, I always, I always end up at source. I always end up at nature. So do those tracing um, exercises. And the more you do it, the more you will find those spider web lines of your connection to everything else. Um, absolutely. Um, also, we know, especially uh, when it comes to indigenous uh, people, um, the entity um, of nature and um, everything that is uh, surrounding uh, and is around us uh, is the key. And that's been one of the uh, topics these days that um, they are trying to focus on to give nature that entity and the rights. Um, and in that way, uh, we will be able to protect them. Um, I would like to also know your thoughts on that. Do you think by doing so and giving them the entity they need and the rights, would that be um, um, a positive way forward in order to be able to conserve nature better? I'm not sure if you're asking me, but I think the rights of nature movement and discourse is extremely interesting uh, and very timely. Um, I think there are benefits to it, of course, recognizing that we are not the only entities that, 
that um, are striving for our own persistence and have value in the world. But I also think that there are risks around applying a rights-based discourse um, to nature in the in the sense of it doesn't it does still tend to create separations and lines of division, and so. Um, you can say, well, what's the entity? Where are the boundaries of the thing that has the rights? Um, and rights, um, I like to also think of it in terms of duties. Rights might just say this has, we, it has an, you know, the, we are obliged to do things rather than we do things out of care or love or um, compassion and respect and empathy. And I think empathy is one of the things that was relevant for a lot of the questions that have come up, you know, in terms of solidarity and things too. We don't do it just because someone has a right to a job. We do it because we understand and we have empathy with the position of what it means to lose a job and how vulnerable it makes you to lose a job. It's not just because someone has a right to employment. Um, so, I think the rights-based discourse is valuable and relevant, but I don't think it's the only one we want to mobilize uh, in the protection of nature because we also want to be mobilizing empathy, love, care, interconnection, um, that rights don't always necessarily help us to advance. Thank you. Um, I think we do have a few more questions actually, um, they keep coming in. So. The next question, what are technology or products um, that can be great solutions in the next year from um, each of your perspectives? <laughs> that stumped me, I'm afraid. <laughs> I have no great insights there into what, what technology. I mean, just from an Irish perspective, the only thing that the, the, the great hope that we have is that we've got an absolutely remarkable reservoir of wind energy off our western seaboard. Um, if we can tap into that, that could be an absolute game changer for this country and possibly for large parts of Western Europe as well. Um, but beyond that, there goes my proficiency in technology. I'm a big fan of social innovation, so I wouldn't want to leave out um, sort of social ways of changing the world rather than just technology and products. But I can tell you about a technology that has has changed my life and my impact on the environment, and that is my electric bicycle. And I can tell you right now that I live quite far from where I have to go every day for work and all my other activities and from stores and things. I live in the middle of beautiful nature. Uh, but that electric bike has made it's not an option between a car which is extremely flexible and good and collective transport which is very unreliable and very scarce and not always practical and appealing it's given me the option in between where i have flexibility um, without uh, massive environmental impacts um, because we are driven by water uh, hydropower here in norway so the powering of my bike is great. Um, but I think these technologies that find where, where the uh, option, for example, between driving a car and taking collective transport, the collective transport is held up as the environmental um, alternative that's valuable. Um, and yet it's it's got its own lack of appeal and it's missing some of the things. So the technologies that find that middle path, like an electric bike, and that combine multiple benefits. Benefits for the environment gives me flexibility. I get a workout, but it's not too much of a workout. Uh, you know, so I think there's, there's that's the technologies that occupy those spaces in the middle between the good and bad behaviors as they're currently cast uh, are what I'm most excited about. I'm so. Yeah. I think uh, from from my perspective, you know, the big question that we always have in the cultural sector is, is related to materials and it's always plastics. And, you know, what? how can we replace plastics in our use in archives, collections, care, conservation. And it's tough, um, especially because, you know, we have to take into consideration the work of art and it could be contaminated by, you know, an, in an, an inert material, an uninert material. Um, but, you know, what ways can we find um, alternatives for the materials that we use every day? And there are a lot of really amazing um, new types of foams that are coming out, which sounds like such a simple thing, but actually can make a huge impact in a lot of different parts of our of our um, sector. You know, things like 
shipping from Amazon. It's, you know, there, I know that they've transferred from the styrofoam to, you know, plastic bubbles, but there's a step further that that's not fossil fuel induced. And so I think that um, alternatives to the materials that we use every day are going to be hugely important for the transition. Um, like we were talking about earlier, this idea of forcing someone to change their habits and their daily practice. I think we, it needs to come from all directions and we need to meet in the middle. And, you know, maybe there's not a, you're out and you need a bottle of water and there's no water fountain around. You're going to buy a bottle of water, but if that bottle of water is not made from plastic, then, Oh, isn't that nice. You still have the convenience of being able to access water, but you don't have to actually um, buy plastic bottle. So I think that alternative materials are going to be hugely important. And I'm really excited to see um, continued developments in that area. Thank you, Caitlin. And um, moving on to the next question. In ESG, how do you define the S, the social? What is social sustainability? And what is social capital? Well, I'd, I'd be happy to jump into this one. Um, social sustainability for, especially in the cultural sector, is hugely important. And um, there's this movement right now called decolonization. And if you don't know much about decolonization or uh, from the cultural perspective. It's really about representing histories, representing artworks from all perspectives using all voices. So the idea that you go into a museum and your experience is very one-sided and a lot of times it is. Um, for example, if you go to a Viking museum in Norway, you may only be looking at it from the perspective of the Vikings or the winners. And decolonization takes into consideration all of the people involved. And this is a huge movement right now. Um, it tackles structural racism, it tackles injustices, but it also invites in voices from all communities. And so for us, that's a, pretty much at the heart of when we're talking about the social aspects and how can we make sure that we are not only being inclusive of portraying everyone's voices, but we're also safe spaces for community engagement, that we're representing our communities, that we're serving our communities, and that we're accessible to everybody. And that, you know, the cultural sector is not a leisure activity for, you know, rich Western culture or rich Western um entities, societies, but it's actually something for everybody and that it's accessible for everyone. So for us, that's this, the social aspect is hugely, hugely important and um, very much on uh, ingrained in, in our daily practice and the movement towards a sustainable future. Thank you. Uh, would any of you uh, like to also answer the question or shall we move on to the next one? Next. <laughs> I would just also say that the the social for me is is it's about the relationships and the way we form communities mm -hmm. and what those communities look like and what values we place in our social interactions in our social um, community structures. Uh, so it's it has an overlap with what some people might call culture, but it's not so much linked to me to um, history and traditions necessarily, but it's about how we come together uh, and work together and live together and be together uh, and what kind of ways we want to do that. Thank you. Um, so next question. What do you see uh, is the link of social sustainability and social capital to business? Um, the first thing that will occur to me um, is that business doesn't exist without them. Um, and business cannot hope to prosper or thrive in, into the future without them. And, and if you go back to the previous question, I mean, if you think of that social capital as that kind of intangible element that binds communities together um, and, uh, and keeps us you know, uh, I suppose healthy in many respects in, in terms of the earlier discussion around empathy and solidarity. Um, but without that kind of intangible so social capital, there is no platform on which to build um, and there are no structures in which, you know, to, in which to function. Um, so, yeah, it, I don't see how you could divorce one from the other. I, I just don't think it's possible. Thank you. Um... Would you like to also answer the question, Caitlin Fan? I, I just agree with uh, was said. I think that you know it's businesses um, 
are going, I mean, there's been so many studies on this that businesses that have social sustainability as ingrained in their in their infrastructure are more successful. Um, the more input that you can get from diverse groups, the stronger your business is going to be. So I think that, um, you know, businesses that embrace that are going to flourish. And that's kind of the end of that. <laughs> Thank you. Fern, would you like to also answer this question? I mean, I guess I agree with what the other speakers have said. I would maybe just also um, just pull back that businesses are also, they have their own um, social practices internally. Um, so one thing is about how they're socially sustainable in a broader community perspective, but um, whole, the whole sort of work around organizational culture and how we work together within a business is worth thinking about the links there and not just thinking about how does my business affect the world outside, but how am I actually mobilizing um, concepts and practices of sustainability within the environment of the business itself within its own organizational culture and that includes sort of questions of how I take care of social sustainability and take care of my workers and make sure um, that there is a sustainable practice within and without. Thank you, Fan. Um, I believe we have one more question. Just waiting for it to appear on the screen. What can climate reality leaders do to accelerate change for good? Um, well, I, I mean, you know, what um, Al Gore always says is talk about it. And that's the first thing that I always say when people say, what is one thing I can do today to, you know, help with the environment, it's oh, it's talking about it. It's building awareness, and that's what climate reality leaders are trained to do. I mean, we're trained to go out into our communities and educate people about uh, the climate crisis. And I think that that um, you know, take it one step further. It's not just about you know, if I put my pin on and I'm going to go out and give a presentation. It's about ingraining it into everyday conversation with every person that you interact with. And I always talk about you know ways that. As, as cultural professionals, we can start to build that awareness within our within our organizations and create um, cultures of sustainability within organizations. And it starts with one person bringing it up in conversation. And I think that um, that's really the most powerful thing that we can do is to is to think about it or is to talk about it. Because if you talk about it, you start thinking about it more. And as as we've talked about all you know earlier that people are willing to do something. It's just sometimes they need a reminder. Sometimes it's it's not the first thing that comes to their head. And so the more we start thinking about the climate crisis in terms of solutions, and the more we start thinking about what we can do as individuals and what our agency is, I think the more likely people are to actually start changing their habits. And so if we can start if we can just continue to remind each other, continue to talk about it, continue to celebrate successes and celebrate solutions, um, those will start being more and more ingrained into our daily habits and our daily work. And that will continue to build this movement in a way that we can actually succeed. Yeah, I, th I think it's everything that's been said. Hello, I'm Al Gore. Sorry, I think it's everything that's been said, interrupted by Al Gore. That's the first thing. <laughs> I think it's everything that's been said in this conversation so far. Um, and I think it's about ultimately giving people a sense of hope and a sense that there are opportunities and positive and, and, and benefits on the far side. Um, and about society collectively meeting an enormous challenge and collectively building something better. I think it might be as simple as that. I agree. I think the way we talk about it is really important. It's this idea, it has to be positive. It has to be hopeful. It can't be, um, we can't continue to just rely on a crisis narrative um, because it's not functioning. And we've seen that this idea of a positive vision of positive stories, positive examples, solution based practices and hope is really, really important. I would absolutely agree with that. But I also think it's about avoiding the trap of perfection, assuming that we have to have the right solution um, before we do anything or that because I ride an electric bike but I still did 
you know, drive my car the other day, I feel terrible and I'm going to be blamed and I'm going to be shamed or whatever. It's this idea of every little step, every piece we do, we need to celebrate that, embrace that and not expect that we're going to find a perfect solution that everyone can implement and we have to wait for that um, to arrive. So embrace embrace our own imperfections, embrace the the ambiguities that are, that are necessary, but celebrate the positives and, and tell hopeful stories about futures that we want to inhabit. Thank you. And um, I think we still have one more question. Um, I'm loving this. We are getting um, many questions from our audience. So um, the last question, what are their hopes for to 2022? Your hopes for 2022? Better, better than 2021. <laughs> That's I hope that we learn, bar, right? <laughs> Sorry, <go> ahead, <laughs> yeah, relatedly, I, I hope that we learn from the pandemic. Uh, I feel like we're on a transition into another kind of space in 2022. I feel, feel things shifting. Um, and I hope we learn from the pandemic that there are, there are lots of ways we can change mm. our socio-political and economic structures. We've seen it happen immediately. Um, and so pick up the lessons from that and move forward in good ways. Hope for nature, then, that is. Um, so, uh, Caitlin, could you please also share with us your hope as the That's voice of culture for 2022? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, what I would like to see in the cultural sector is people to have, it's the cultural sector to have hope and to have that recognition of their own agency and own capacities and embrace that and run with it. Um, you know, all of the work that I do in my organization is to try and empower the cultural sector to become leaders. And I'm hoping that by the end of 2022, I'd like to see that really, that really taking form and building this community, this international holistic approach to sustainability and to commitment to tackling the climate crisis and having, having this be a priority. Um, I think that that's, that's really something that I would like to see shift is that, you know, sustainability is no longer a nicety, but it's something that is um, integral and integrated into everything that we do and that it is the priority and that we're all on the same page and moving forward together. Thank you. And uh, Matt Dara, can we also hear from you? Um, hopes for 2022 for the employees and just, after the of employees. Uh, just to, to echo what was said earlier, I think there are some, and I, I have said it already, but there are some incredibly positive learnings to be had from the pandemic and we can utilize and deploy them. I mean, in some respects, we saw the world turned on its head in the pandemic and uh, we saw conventional economic thought turned on its head. Uh, we were, things we were told were actually impossible to do or implement happened overnight. And I can think of multiple examples from this country. Uh, we banned people being evicted from their homes during the pandemic. We were told before that that was legally impossible and constitutionally prohibited. It happened overnight. We banned rent rises for people who were suffering, you know, or went into arrears because of the pandemic and so on and so on. Multiple changes that we were told could never actually happen because they were impossible happened. So to take those positive learnings and use them throughout 22 and apply them to the transition. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time, for your insights and sharing with us your ex expertise and uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and good luck with the rest of your conference. Absolutely.